<laughs> okay, everybody, at 6 o'clock, we'll start a public comment session. Please turn your phones at least on vibrate, if not off altogether. Good evening, everyone. I'm Rob Bizzle, Chairman of the North Carolina Marine Fisheries Commission, and would like to welcome you to our public comment session where you have a unique opportunity to, on the record, give comments in regards to the Marine Fishery Commission's management of the state's public trust estuarine and marine resources. I ask you to limit your comments to three minutes. You will be reminded when you have approximately 30 seconds left. If you address the commission tonight, you will not be allowed to do so tomorrow morning. Remember, this is a time to share a concern or gather information, not to be confrontational. Okay, up first tonight is Jerry Shield, followed by Captain Irwin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. First of all, uh, my name is Jerry Schill, Director of Government Affairs for the North Carolina Fisheries Association. Would like to welcome the new members. And uh, if anyone wants to find out what fisheries discussions can do to you over time, you can look at Doug Rader's gray hair and my white hair, and you'll see it. <laughs> well, and lack thereof. <laughs> um, Last, last meeting, I just talked about a little bit about the striped bass issue, um, the issue, that, the concern that we had that science was ignored um, by this commission. And it was pointed out by uh, then uh, Marine Fisheries Director um, Steve Murphy. And it was also pointed out by uh, Secretary Michael Regan, who was secretary at the time of the department. I would just like to add to that that this commission exists as a result of the Fisheries Reform Act that was signed by Governor Hunt 25 years ago. And uh, I was in attendance at the Capitol building when he signed that. And uh, that's, that's what put the Marine Fisheries Commission in existence. You, the commission exists because of that statute. Um, just, and just like they uh, put in statute the makeup of the commission and your duties and responsibilities, they also provide oversight. And uh, so I would remind every member of the commission that there is a spotlight on the commission um, on whether or not you are abiding by your duties and responsibilities especially when it comes to the areas of science. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Captain Irwin, followed by Thomas Newman. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the board. My name is Captain Josiah Irwin. I am uh, in the United States Marine Corps. I just recently PCS'd here from California. And I will say that the fishery out here was one of the reasons I made my decision to PCS. I have been fishing since I was 10, and it has been a big part of my life. And I have traveled the world, not only in the Marine Corps, but also my five years in college as a uh, oil field worker in Qatar, Dubai, Saudi Arabia, Texas, Oklahoma, and the Dakotas. And I will say that the fishery laws here seem to be a little out of whack. And I feel like they can be practiced a little bit better. Um, specifically, I'm looking at like the flounder and the red snapper seasons here. Um, it seems that they are mismanaged inappropriately, not so much in the way that we can go far right with it, as in Hawaii and Guam where there are no regulations, or I think a better example would be what exists in Texas. In Texas, for redfish, you get a tag. So whenever you catch a redfish, you get a tag to go with that redfish. You pay for it beforehand. If something like that was implemented for red snapper or flounder, it would be able to reduce your numbers as well as increase your profits. You would be able to implement the tag for about $3 for red snapper or flounder, however you wanted to do the metric, 
and it would be an easier way for you guys to measure your amount of fish that you get and come in without going over in your weightage. Thank you. Thank you. Thomas Newman, followed by Senator Sanderson. Uh, my name is Thomas Newman. I'm a full-time commercial fisherman, a member of the Northern Advisory Panel, and a part-time employee at North Carolina Fisheries Association. Uh, first, I want to congratulate the recently reappointed commissioners and the new commissioners. Uh, thank you all for serving. It's an important job you got. I'm here tonight to uh, urge you to reopen the Pamlico and Noose Rivers to all user groups, specifically commercial gillnet fishermen. During the March 2019 emergency meeting, the rationale the commissioners used to close the Noose and Pamlico Rivers to gillnets was to protect the breeding age, age class of striped bass. The March 2019 river closure was unjustified and deemed unnecessary by then Director, the Director Murphy and also DEQ Secretary Reagan. The decision to close our rivers to gillnets had nothing to do with protecting striped bass, but was simply a means to an end to remove a legal harvest method that some people personally do not like. Gillnets produced the least amount of striped bass discards in these areas. Recreational discards were two and a half times higher than the commercial discards in these two river systems alone from 2012 to 2020. This does not include the hundreds of thousands of recreational discards of striped bass in the Roanoke Albemarle stock. The commissioners also said at this March 2019 emergency meeting that reopening the rivers to gillnets would be looked at in two years at the next striped bass FMP amendment. The division and the Escherine striped bass uh, FMP advisory committee did just that. They put together and presented the draft for amendment two of the striped bass FMP for the spring 2022 FMC meeting. This draft included the option to reopen our rivers to gillnets. But during this meeting, the Marine Fisheries Commission voted to completely remove this option from the draft FMP before it even had a chance to be reviewed by the advisory panels or the general public. In the May 2022 Marine Fisheries Commission meeting, the hastiness, bad judgment, and unfairness used by the commissioners in 2019 was discussed. This discussion was not about protecting a breeding age class of striped bass. This discussion was anecdotal of how recreational fishermen are catching more of this and bigger that now that the gillnets are out of the water. The Marine Fisheries Commission had no scientific evidence to justify continuing this closure, yet they voted gillnets as guilty once again. But this time they said they would finally start looking for evidence that the gillnets were affecting the striped bass stock. Condemned as guilty first, then look for evidence three years seconds. later. Not the way this commission should operate. Commercial fishermen deserve equal access to have the opportunity to harvest fish in these areas. Many citizens of the state only way to get fresh seafood and fresh bait is to buy commercially harvested fish. To keep these areas closed is to limit consumer access to fresh seafood and bait. Thank you all for your time. Thanks, sir. Senator Sanderson, followed by Hodge Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I also want to commend the members of this commission for your, the role you play that is so very, very, very important to so many citizens in North Carolina, and to also recommend or commend the ones that are just be sworn in tomorrow morning, I think. But I also want to give out a shout out to the uh, staff of the Vision Marine Fisheries, and especially these officers behind us who put their lives out there every day to protect a natural resource that belongs to all of us. You, you're probably going to hear a little bit of what's already been said, but if I try to ad-lib this, I'll go way over my three minutes. As Senate Vice Chair of the Joint Legislative Oversight Committee on Ag, Natural, and Economic Resources, I appreciate the Division of Marine Fisheries and the Marine Fisheries Commission's efforts in preparing this latest amendment to the North Carolina Striped Bass uh, FMP. Our number one goal with any new or revised plan should always be to provide sustainable fisheries populations across all of our endangered species. While I commend the effort to put into to the plan or put into the plan before us tonight, I have significant concerns about the included measures to extend the ban on gillnets in the Upper Noose and Pamlico Rivers above the ferry lines. This action does not appear to be based on science and was not part of the original DMF's proposal. It was added by this commission at its February 2022 meeting. The current exclusions in the Upper River areas were put in place in 2019 at an emergency meeting of the MFC 
That decision led, as you've heard, the Secretary of DEQ, Michael Regan, to issue a news release saying the MFC used bad judgment and directing the DMF to include the gear exclusions contradicts science and the re recommendations of the division scientists. The D Division of Marine Fisheries Director at that time, Steve Mercy, sent a five-page letter to our current chairman, Mr. Bissell, after the Marine Fisheries Commission decided to close the areas. His letter documented the DMF's concerns on instituting a gill net ban in light of the evidence. He stated that such measures not supported by the data that support gill nets as the primary or even the most significant source of the discard mortality. I also am concerned that during the MFC Advisory Committee review process required by the Fisheries Reform Act of, of 97, the Marine Fisheries Commission did not allow public comment on extending closure or reopening the areas to gill nets. The current recommendation, recommended action to ban the use of nets in spite of the fact the MFC Regional Advisory Committees, whose review is required, voted to advise MFC the upper river areas be open to netting has me wondering where is the right and where is the wrong. It's my understanding that no new data has been collected since 2019 that sheds additional light on this issue and the concerns expressed by the division, the regional advisory committees, Secretary Regan in 2019 are still valid. The lack of new data, the fact that existing science does not appear to support such action, that DM, uh, DMF did not propose such actions in its original plan. 30 seconds. And, and that the advisory committees advise the rejected proposals me to be concerned about this measure being included at this time. The actions taken this week must provide for fair regulation of both commercial and recreational fishing groups and all citizens of North Carolina as we move towards fish population sustainability. And as Chairman Bissell and I was taking, I know the job that you have. I know how hard it is to manage something that you can't see. I used to say that uh, Time. hurting cats was the hardest thing in the world to do, but I've since changed that to hurting fish. It's <laughs> a hot, harder than hurting cats. Thank so, you, Senator. Again, thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you too, sir. Hodge Jordan followed by David Sneed. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I wanted to touch on two things. The first is the ITPs, which are coming up for, for renewal in 2023. Um, so that's an inc incidental take program or permit for endangered species. And we have to, you have to have that in order to have the gill nets. Is that correct or no? Okay. Um, when we've had that, I would love to know what is how many reported kills of turtles by fishermen and netters have we received? Um, how many sturgeon and how many bycatch? I know that gill nets themselves, 48% of all caught in gill nets is bycatch, and that's 100% mortality within that. That's, those are just facts. Um, if we have if, if these numbers aren't reported by the netters themselves, then the monitoring that we have doesn't seem to be working. Um, then, then we come to the, the point, if you have a turtle caught an in, or in any endangered species caught in a net, how do you release it? One, it's illegal for me to touch it as a you know, I'm driving by my boat, I see a turtle, whatever. All I can do is report it. Um, that's why the ITPs need to have a more public forum so people are informed of what they can and cannot do and what these, exactly what the ITPs mean to the public, not to someone who reads about it. Uh, you know, people here are informed. But this is a public resource and it should be publicized to them in a form that they can understand without bias. And I really appreciate your time. I could not agree more that y'all are t like trying to herd cats. And I realize that the, the difference between, you know, commercial and recreational, there is a balance that we need to maintain. Um, and science is science. And there is, without good data, you don't get good results. And I appreciate your time. Thank you for your comments. David Sneed, followed by Mike Brady.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is David Sneed, and I serve as the Executive, Di Di Executive Director of the Coastal Conservation Association in North Carolina. First, I would also like to welcome our new commissioners, and thank you for your willingness to serve. Also, welcome back to the uh, three recently reappointed commissioners. Uh, I grew up in eastern North Carolina, so the conservation of our coastal resources is important to me personally and not just professionally. The house next door to my family where we have a place on the Pamlico River was recently sold to a new family. This past weekend, I watched a father and his two grown sons fish off the end of their pier all weekend long. They fish late into the night and early into the early morning hours. The father told me how excited his boys were that they had moved there because they loved to fish so much. I also watched as the crab boats came by the same piers each morning to check their pots. It certainly gave be an idyllic vision of how the fishing public and commercial fishermen can coexist in the same environment when a healthy fishery is present. I also grilled fresh local mahi for dinner one night and fried up some farm-raised oysters that coincidentally came from Doug Cross's Pamlico Packing Company. And I say that not to uh, try to curry favor, but uh, just to point out my, one of my wife's favorite Sunday night dinners is fried oysters. Um, we would like to encourage this commission to work with stakeholders, not as adversaries, but as partners, toward a future that produces a truly sustainable and abundant coastal fishery for anglers, fishermen, and consumers, and the public that may never wet a line or eat seafood at all, but maybe they just enjoy an environment where they can watch dolphin and sea turtles swim freely along our coast, a future where our children can grow up with a love for fishing off the end of the pier and our commercial fishermen can supply us with sustainable local seafood. You have a light agenda this week, but we all know that there's plenty of work ahead if we want to restore our coastal fisheries to where it should be and reverse the effects uh, decades of overfishing have had on important fish stocks like striped bass, spot, croaker, weak fish, blue crab, and southern flounder. Amendment three to the southern flounder FMP spelled it out very clearly. And I quote, overfished means there are not enough mature females to produce enough young. Overfishing means that fish are being removed faster than they can be replaced. Reducing the number seconds. of fish removed annually is needed to increase the southern flounder stock to sustainable levels, end quote. Simple enough, right? To me, the message is clear. Stop managing for maximum harvest and start managing with a conservation threshold so we are putting away some fish for the future. That is the true path to a sustainable fishery. Thank you again for your service. With your help, we can leave a healthy coastal fishery for our children and grandchildren. Thank you, David. Mike Brady, followed by Donald Willis. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for the opportunity to talk. I'm just a normal recreational fisherman here to express my views. On what I've personally seen and what I feel like is occurring within the great state of North Carolina, I do appreciate being here. I'm uh, originally from North Carolina, native. I spent some time in the Navy active duty, came back here. I have a couple of degrees from the state universities. Um, over that time, I started fishing when I was in elementary school. Done it all, shore, pier, inshore, offshore, near shore. I've seen the fisheries flourish, I've seen them diminish, and I see them right now struggling from a personal viewpoint two or three times a week in the marsh, watching, watching boats go by. Last year I saw as many net boats as I've ever seen in my life in a small area. And I wondered what in the world could they be doing because the fish weren't around. I've seen trout fisheries shut down in White Oak River when day one of the netting season started. Before that, we were catching nice slot trout, keeper trout, releasing 15 to 17 trout per trip. And as soon as that netting season started, it stopped. You were lucky to catch undersized. The fishery can't be sustained when we have these events. We all know that Gill nets are not friendly to fish, turtles, anything in the water. If you're an unlucky diver and you happen to wander into one, the net's all over you, okay? So it's destructive. Whether the fish gets in or stays there, it's damaged. 
because it probably won't survive if it does get out. There's got to be a better way. Hook and line. I release fish in good health. I take the effort. I have a rubber, rubberized net so that I don't damage the fish. These efforts, these everyday fishermen are out there trying to sustain and keep these fisheries going. Now, part of this netting problem that I saw last year was nobody was accounting for it. I didn't see fisheries officers anywhere. I don't know the state of Manning. I know they're kind of undermanned from what I've heard. I know I have seen very few people take surveys at the ramp on recreational seconds. numbers. So my big question is, how in the world are recreational catch numbers determined? And I think we should do away with the term catch and start looking at harvest and release numbers to be more accurate. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Donald Willis followed by Rocky Carter. Hello, I'm Donald Willis. I make my money off the recreational fishery and I've been doing it for coming up on four decades very soon. I've been going to fishery meetings for almost 30 years. I've seen maximum extraction voted in and done and status quo after that on fishing that were fish that were overfished for years. I have watched three major fisheries, if not well four now, crash and burn. I've seen a lot of things. I've seen this, I've seen the commission go from inactive on uh, taking care of the resource to reactive, and I'm hoping this new commission can become more proactive in what we're doing to protect our fish. If we protect the resource, we take care of everybody, commercial, wrecks, everybody, but we can't do it if we let greed step in and we're taking too many fish, we've already seen what's happened. I've seen it in my lifetime. I've watched what's happened. And I'm looking for good things from this commission. You take the Upper Noose and the Upper Pamtar River. It's absolutely amazing what's going on up there right now with the nets out of the river. I understand why the commercials want to go up there, because that's where the fish are. You get past the ferry line and there's hardly nothing. Everything's upriver. We need to look at that, and we need to look at why other states have done the same things on larger scales, and they still have a commercial fishery, and better than North Carolina's. If there's more resource, if there's more fish, everybody benefits. Your number one job here is to take care of the resource, not get into this he said, she said battle, commercials, wrecks. It's all about the resource people. Take care of it, and it will take care of all of us. That's all I ask out of you. And thank you for your time. Thanks, sir. Rocky Carter, followed by Bruce McLachlan. Good evening, commissioners, and thank you for this opportunity to speak tonight. Um, to begin with, I'm not from eastern North Carolina. I'm from western North Carolina. I was born in a little town called Asheville, about as far away as you can get from here, 365 miles to be exact. Uh, I came here uh, fishing when I was young, fell in love with the coast of North Carolina, and 17 years ago, I chose to make my life here. I came here not only to live, but I came here to die. This was a place of my final resting. When I came here, there was great and abundant fishing. And I've watched the decline. I've seen it with my own eyes, and I've experienced it. I've experienced it with my friends. I've experienced it with my neighbors. And I've experienced it for... Uh, with our entire community, fishing community, where I live in Swansboro. I'm a little bit concerned about the process to obtain an ITP here in North Carolina. So I have some questions. 
Who fills out the application for the ITP? Is it somebody that has a regular job with the Department of Marine Fisheries? Is it a number of people with the Department of Marine Fisheries? Is it contractors that are hired to fill these papers out? And at what cost to the state of North Carolina does it cost us to have an ITP? And who pays the bill? Is it the taxpayers that pay the bill for an ITP? Um, what is the, uh, well, let me back up just a little bit. Is the MFC involved in the approval of the application of the ITP? Is the governing body for who we uh, know makes the rules and regulations for coastal North Carolina and our fisheries, how involved are you with the ITP? Is it something that uh, uh, you're questioned about? You're, is it discussed any? I haven't heard it on any public forum. Uh, is the ITP brought up in advisory committee meetings? If so, what committee meetings? And who chairs those committee meetings? And what data is available from those meetings saying that this was adequately discussed and seemed to be necessary for the citizens in the state of North Carolina? With approximately 800 gill net fishermen seconds. in our state, uh, each with allotted 800 yards of gill nets, just coincidentally, there's 365 miles of gill nets in North Carolina, the same distance from here to where I was born in Nashville. With that many miles of nets in the water, how many interactions with turtles are reported or self-reported by our commercial fishermen? Uh, is that in line with the expectations with those many miles? Time. I had to call time on you, sir. Thank you, Thank you for your comments. Bruce McLachlan. Well, uh, good evening. Um, after doing everything I could uh, for 26 years to avoid coming to North Carolina in the Marine Corps, they dropped me off here in 2004 uh, where I retired after 30 years. And uh, among the many reasons why I stayed here, just because of the beautiful place, it's a, it's a wonderful community with great people. Of all the 50 states I could have chosen, I stayed here primarily because of the fishing opportunities when, uh, uh, that I uh, observed and participated in when I came here in 2004. Uh, since then, I have watched a steady decline in just about every inshore species of fish that I have uh, pursued and fished for. Every single one of them has gone downhill. Um, I think we have seen a lot of opportunities to take the proactive management stance that uh, Mr. Willis talked about and that those opportunities uh, somehow eluded commissions prior to this one. Uh, I hope that uh, you take a very good look at where our fisheries are, where they were, and where they need to go and stop the excessive take, particularly of species like southern flounder, where we had an opportunity 10 years ago to fix that, and we didn't. And here we are today. Thank you very much. I wish you well. Thank you, sir. Has everybody had the opportunity to address the commission that wants to tonight? If so, our public comment session has ended, and we'll see you all back here tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock. Thank you.